Hello and welcome to another episode of The Cost of Glory. This is Alex Petkus. At Ancient Life Coach, it is our mission to retell for you the most influential biographies in history and also to help you draw practical insights from them. We use Plutarch as our guide. In the last episode, we heard about Sertorius's meteoric rise and his tragic end. Now, as I've mentioned before, Plutarch paired Greeks and Romans together. He picked two men that he saw as having similar dispositions or destinies or missions in life and compare them. Now, because I really mean what I say about using him as our guide, as our ancient life coach, I'm going to follow his lead and save the bulk of my analysis about Sertorius for the comparison with Eumenes of Cardia, who's coming up next. So analysis through comparison, that was Plutarch's idea. But it's going to be a couple more weeks before we release the Eumenes episodes, and I realize that's kind of a long time to wait for most normal people, and it's hard to keep the whole narrative in your head for that long. So in this briefer episode, I want to do a couple of things to help you out. First, I'll briefly summarize some of the main points of Sertorius's career. And I'm imagining this episode can be a way for you to come back and review the highlights if you'd like to refresh before hearing the comparison in a few weeks. And I'll try to do this with other biographies to be a kind of cliff notes in case you want to skip a life and come back to it later for some reason, but to get the gist in the meantime. Then, as promised, I'll do a brief epilogue in this episode about the immediate aftermath of Sertorius's downfall, and I'll close with a few takeaways and also some questions to think about for next time. If you want to skip to the epilogue, that starts around six minutes in. As always, I'm very interested in your thoughts and feedback and questions you may have, so don't hesitate to reach out to me on Twitter, either at Cost of Glory or at Alex Petkus. You can also send me an email at alex at ancientlifecoach.com, and you can sign up for our weekly email list on the website, again, ancientlifecoach.com. In those emails, I give you a brief, typically less than 300 word exhortation drawn from ancient practical wisdom, stories, anecdotes, quotes, always with an eye to both entertain and give you some extra tools or energy to face your own challenges. So then we've heard the story now of how Sertorius rose from being an obscure Sabine, maybe a turnip farmer, to become one of Rome's finest soldiers, even a statesman. And his story is also the story of a great Roman civil war. Marius and later Cinna, those populist reformers, as we might call them, they were on a collision course with Sulla and the conservatives. This war was perhaps inevitable, whether it happened in one decade or another, but it just so happened fate decreed that the war would break out at the very prime of Sertorius's life when he was at the peak of his physical strength, mental acuity, and social capital. Sertorius fought with Cinna and the populist reformers against Sulla and his supporters, the Optimates. After Cinna's death, Sertorius was denied a truly executive role in the war against Sulla, and he was sent to Spain by the senators in Rome. On the surface of it, he was sent to raise troops for the war effort or to set up another sphere of operations, but to a large part he was sent there because his help wasn't wanted in Italy. Being a small-town country boy, he lacked that sophisticated urbanity, that polish that the nobility liked to see in the candidates they supported for commanding roles, like praetor and consul. He didn't have those family connections. And it showed. The great orator Cicero made this clear when he wrote about him later. Even though Sertorius was a talented speaker, he wasn't an educated man. It wasn't easy for the nobles to say, oh, he's one of us. But when he got to Spain and secured his position, and it took more than a little effort to do that, once he got there, he had the opportunity to show the world what a real difference competence makes. He recruited native Spaniard allies, Celt-Iberians, Lusitanians, and others, people who were barbarians in the eyes of most Romans. And combining these with his meager Roman forces, he made himself a match for Metellus, one of the great commanders of his day, sent by Sulla to destroy him. The native Spaniards loved him. He studied them, learned their ways, taught them his own. They treated him like one of their own chieftains. One thing I didn't mention in the biography is that one tribe of Iberians had a custom of religiously consecrating themselves to their leader, taking an oath to give their lives to save him or die with him in battle if he fell. 
and many thousands of them consecrated themselves in this way to Sertorius. Sertorius also outwitted and outgeneraled Pompey the Great, who went on to fame as one of the most talented generals in Roman history. But Sertorius couldn't escape the rot of Rome, the arrogant and often delusional classism of the fossilized nobility, men of great ancestors. Four years after Sulla's victory in the Civil War, Sulla died, and disaffected senators led an uprising to try to reinstate the many exiles like Sertorius. When they were defeated, they brought the remnants of their forces to Spain to join with him. One of these men, a nobleman named Marcus Perperna, the leader of the disaffected refugee senators, eventually decided he could do a better job than this commoner Sertorius. So he organized a conspiracy and murdered Sertorius. That's where we left off last episode. Now, there is some grim satisfaction to be had in the aftermath. After the assassination, Marcus Perperna, the ringleader of the coup, he quickly gathers up Sertorius' forces, and he makes an inept attack on Pompey. And morale can't have been very high among Sertorius' troops. It came to light that Sertorius had in fact received warnings that Perperna wasn't to be trusted. But even so, Sertorius still kept the man in his last will and testament as one of the heirs to his possessions. He simply refused to believe the rumors about his friend, and this infuriated his troops against Perperna. So Perperna leads these soldiers against Pompey, and in the battle, Pompey soundly defeats Perperna and takes him prisoner. At this point, Perperna tried to save his own skin. He told the soldiers guarding him to send a message to Pompey. He said, I can show you autographed letters from leading men in the Roman Senate addressing Sertorius, letters inviting him to come to Italy, promising these men support and the support of many others when Sertorius arrives. Here was proof of how close the state came to falling under Sertorius's power. Pompey can see it, and he's being offered a dossier of documents that could be used in court to show who was in on it. These men were corresponding with public enemy number one, promising him support. This was treason. Pompey could take these guys down, confiscate their property. This was a chance for another very profitable round of proscriptions, like the ones Sulla had enacted. Perperna knows it, and he was willing to betray these men to save his own skin. Men who would have celebrated him and Sertorius in triumph if they had won. But here, Pompey showed wisdom beyond his years. The state was now teetering on the edge of yet another bloody political purge. Pompey, though, had lived through the massacres of Sulla. He saw that even if he were the one doing the purging, it was unlikely to bring about any lasting peace for the Republic. Pompey had greater ambitions than destroying enemies in another round of civil war. So Pompey ordered the papers of Sertorius and Perperna to be rounded up and burned, and didn't allow anybody to see them, not even himself. Then he had Perperna executed quickly. The rest of the conspirators, the murderers of Sertorius, they were either found by Pompey and executed, or fled to Libya, and the natives got them there. But for most of the rest of Sertorius' followers, Pompey actually lobbied in the Senate and helped push through a very generous amnesty. The surviving Romans were eager now to put an end to this terrible civil war. That was 72 BC. Not a happy ending, but a tolerable resolution for most of the survivors. But what happened to Sertorius' name, his memory? Well... As soon as Sulla had taken power 10 years earlier, back in 82 BC, Sulla and his followers had started vilifying Sertorius, making him out to be a drunk and a savage, a barbarian like the men he commanded, a duplicitous traitor, even an incompetent leader who somehow kept getting lucky. They understood the threat he posed and the importance of the propaganda war. And when he died and this reintegration happened, That story about Sertorius was still the party line in Rome, and none of the men who had secretly corresponded with Sertorius was about to speak up and risk giving away their sympathies. 
As a result, in the years following his death, Sertorius was further demonized by the people who controlled the narrative in Rome. Histories were written and retold at dinner parties and referenced on public occasions. Sertorius was a murderous, power-mongering renegade, an enemy of the state. But many of Sertorius's men were still alive. They kept quiet for now. What's the use in arguing? But they remembered what they had witnessed in Spain, in Africa, and on the seas. And in the next generation, someone came along who was determined to set the story straight. We'll get to that story later, the story of how Sertorius's memory was rehabilitated. Since it's tied in with evaluating the legacy of Sertorius, I'm going to save it for the comparison we do of him and Eumenes. But now, if you find yourself admiring his achievements, how can you emulate Sertorius? Well, here are four things I want you to take away from the story. Number one, focus on doing the best work you can, regardless of the circumstances. This is a stoic principle. Happiness always lies in what is up to us and not in external circumstances. Sertorius didn't give up or complain when he got passed over for jobs. He threw himself into leading rel in the roles that he was in. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't complain at injustice or incompetence. That's often precisely what you can do. In the Civil War, Sertorius berated the Senate for their indecisive, slack handling of the Sulla threat. But when, in response, they sent him to Spain, as an insult, really, he did everything he could with the new opportunity. So, number one, focus on doing the best work you can, regardless of the circumstances. Number two, Play the long game rather than the short one. The long game is the most important one. And this concept of life as a variety of games and games within games is something Jordan Peterson discusses a lot. And what I mean here is don't sacrifice your character for short-term wins. Sertorius didn't make a quick plunder of the province of Spain, get some money and troops and move on. He could have won a lot of short-term advantages, maybe some credit among the nobility in Rome. No, he cut taxes as soon as he arrived, and he set about making long-term friends. Sertorius didn't cheat the Mauritanians in Africa when they were vulnerable. He helped them win their war and return their country to them, even when he had the power to take over the place and exploit it for his immediate advantage. Sertorius was more interested in proving himself to be a man who was worthy of following. He had a reputation for being a good general, but if he wasn't trustworthy, that is, if he did not manifestly possess the virtue of justice, he was never going to get new people to look up to him. Your reputation, your character, is your most important asset. Building that is the most important game you can play. So number one is focus on doing the best work you can. Number two is play the long game rather than the short one. And number three, Always find within you the will to survive. This is something Sertorius had to muster again and again. At the Battle of Arausio, at Castulo, on the seas, when it looked like all hope was lost, and countless times in the Spanish War. And this is especially important for leaders or people who aspire to leadership, but it goes for everyone. If you're ever feeling downtrodden, pushed around, screwed over, ignored, Or if you're ever bereaved of something that seemed to you like life would not be worth living without it. Losing a job, a friend, a loved one, a child. This can be devastating. But you must tune out the noise, search inside of you, and find that quiet bedrock of infinite resolution given to you by God. Or nature, however you want to conceive of it. And use that as your springboard. Press on. Swim across that river. There's always someone counting on you to do that. Perhaps a great many. And you haven't realized it yet. You might not even have met them yet. So number one, focus on doing the best job you can regardless of the circumstances. Number two, play the long game rather than the short one. Three, always find within you the will to survive. And number four, make your mission about something bigger than yourself. This is important for your own motivation. You're not going to get the best performance out of yourself if you are only in it for yourself. You need a more transcendent meaning. But it's even more important when you're leading people, if you want to bring out the best in them. 
Sertorius didn't make his rallying call, help Sertorius achieve something great, or I deserve to be treated better. He didn't even tell the Spaniards that they were fighting for their own independence. It wasn't just about the Lusitanians or the Celtiberians either. It was about leading the restoration of the Roman Republic. In great power struggles, when things descend into internecine strife and factionalism, when there's an authority vacuum, it's hard to find a man of principles. But Sertorius resisted the temptation to make his cause just about his side winning. There was a greater good there, a bigger vision, and he backed it up with his actions. He didn't let Mithridates claim Asia, for example. That kind of integrity of purpose makes someone stand out amidst the chaos. And Sertorius wasn't just ad-libbing, he had studied the situation carefully. He had learned through Rome's troubles with integrating the Italians that there were huge numbers of people who wanted to be part of the great story of Roman supremacy, but who were excluded by the status quo. He was offering the many non-Romans that were fighting for him a chance to partake in that bigger project, to expand their horizons. He showed them something that was good in the past that had nothing to do with them and was now broken, the Roman Republic, and he promised to make it something great that they could be a part of. So those are my top four takeaways on this occasion. Focus on doing a good job now, play the long game, find the will to survive and overcome, and make it about something bigger than yourself. But we can also learn from the mistakes of Sertorius as well. Was he too naive or idealistic to hold on to power in the cynical world of civil war? Was he at times too deferent or trusting? And war is a terrible thing, too, and civil war is the worst kind of war. We may wonder, is it ever worth the cost? We can learn from the mistakes of Marius, who made implacable enemies for himself by betraying those who had helped him. Or from Sulla, whose brutal solution of murdering his enemies failed to bring any lasting peace to the Republic. Those are fuller discussions to have when we come to their biographies. But please reach out and tell me what you think, or share with somebody else, how you're trying to make progress. Until next week, this is Alex Petkus.